Uh, so good morning, everyone. Today we'll have uh, three sub I presentations. Um, our first presentation um, will be by Alex Darwish. Uh, Alex is originally from the Sacramento area. He, uh, like Dr. Hedelman, went to UC Berkeley a couple years after. Um, and uh, was also a medical student at, currently at the California North State University, um, which is just outside of Sacramento. Um, some of his interests include uh, basketball and travel. Um, he's also a big uh, avid plant lover and has uh, 10 plants in his apartment. Uh, so today we have Alex to present our first presentation. Thanks, Juan. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Um, let me load up my presentation here. And Okay, so today I want to talk about management of ischemic priapism. Um, some of the objectives that I have for this talk are to review some of the uh, classification. We're going to talk about imaging, um, mostly the duration-based treatment, that being both medical and surgical. And I have one slide about anticoagulation, um, also a bit about the prognostic considerations. Um, so the week before I got here, um, there was a patient who came to the main hospital here. This was a 32-year-old male with no significant medical history. And when he presented, he had had a painful persistent erection that had started four days before after the use of cocaine. Um, on the first day, he, when he presented to the hospital, he had already failed three rounds of phenylephrine at another facility. Come, we'll come back to him uh, later on. So uh, three main types of priapism, the main one being ischemic, and this makes up 95% of the cases, um, often secondary to drugs. Some that could do it would be uh, trazodone, SSRIs, alpha blockers, cocaine. Um, also some rare causes are IV contrast and TPN. Um, the mechanism is lack of outflow leading to tissue ischemia. Um, another type which makes up 5% is the non-ischemic type. And the mechanism here is fistulas forming between the corporal bodies and the arterioles which lead to excessive inflow. The difference is that the venous system stays open, so not as painful, not as rigid. And then the stuttering type is the type that's usually seen in those with sickle cell. This is a variant of um, ischemic priapism. And the acute episodes are mostly managed the same. The difference is that there's an emphasis on uh, prevention of these uh, shorter duration recurrent episodes from evolving into a major ischemic episode. Important things on the history, um, primarily the duration, but also important to know if there have been any uh, precipitating trauma, um, drugs that might have been contributing to this, um, any underlying hematologic disorder. And then on physical, um, the ischemic type is fully rigid compared to the non-ischemic where it's tumescent but not as rigid. Um, important labs to start with, and these are part of the AUA guidelines, are CBC and hemoglobin electrophoresis because of how sickle cell plays into this. Also urine toxicology, because that can be the etiology of several cases like in ours. And then to diagnose the ischemic type, um, it's necessary to get an ABG from a corporal aspiration. And there's these cutoffs here for acidosis, hypoxia, hypercapnia. Um, if it's equivocal from that corporal ABG, um, an adjunct can be ultrasound. So here's a picture of what an ultrasound might look like early on the left. There's a fluid fluid level from some sedimentation. Um, later on as the disease progresses and there's more um, edema and fibrosis, you can see that the echogenicity is increased throughout the corporal bodies. And then longitudinally on the right, um, you can see obliteration of an artery with an ultrasound. MRI doesn't have any specific guidelines for use in ischemic priapism. Um, but what they have found in a few studies is that it's highly predictive of um, which of these patients will uh, retain some viable smooth muscle in the corpora. Um, so in other words, there's a high level of correlation between um, the histology and the imaging. And uh, if there's an, a rare presentation of a case like this one here where uh, there's a unilateral uh, priapism, this is rare because it's an incomplete septum between the two corpora, so um, that would be uh, easily visualized with the MRI. And then here is a case that's uh, 
due to a malignant infiltration. This is the AUA guideline for managing um, ischemic priapism. And if we zoom in a little bit on the ischemic section, um, you can see that it starts with a corporal ABG, and then if needed, uh, supplemented with the penile ultrasound. And then we'll get into this in more detail, but the first uh, step in treatment is that phenylephrine. And then if that fails to proceed to a distal shunt, from there to a proximal shunt, and then um, a penile prosthetic is something that can be a consideration later on. So this is another algorithm by this paper from Reed, which was part of the AUA update. And if we zoom in a little bit here, um, you can see that it starts out mostly the same with phenylephrine first, followed by the distal T shunt. And then uh, if that fails, you can make the shunt bigger with tunneling. Um, the, the difference here, and I think why it was included in the update is because of this emphasis on anticoagulation. And I'll come back to this, but also I wanna mention that uh, an emphasis here was that you don't always need to start with the least invasive phenylephrine. Depending on the duration, you can also jump directly to the T shunt. Medical management is phenylephrine, and that's usually done at the same time as aspiration of old blood. Aspiration by itself can usually resolve 30% uh, of these, but when it's combined with phenylephrine, that's closer to 80%. And the major toxicity is hypertension, so important to monitor blood pressure um, when this is administered. It's usually done in a dilution between two and 500 micrograms per milliliter and given in one mil milliliter doses. And that's every three to five minutes for up to one hour or until resolution. And then part of the AUA guidelines for this are to do antibiotics and a penile uh, shaft block beforehand. The surgical treatment options for this are shunt. And there's three types, proximal, distal, and venous. Proximal meaning creating a channel between the corpora cavernosa and the corpus spongiosum, whereas the distal is between the corpora and uh, out through the glands. So this transglandular T shunt is the one that's been described uh, as the most efficacious by Reed in this paper. And what this looks like is inserting a 10 blade needle uh, along the axis of the penis just lateral to the meatus. And when that happens, there should be a large amount of dark blood that's extruded. Uh, if not, um, then there's an option to do tunneling, which is essentially taking a urethral dilator and inserting it along that same axis to make the shunt bigger. If the priapism doesn't resolve after tunneling, then the question becomes whether you're dealing with true recurrence of the priapism or uh, post ischemic hyperemia, which would be expected. And to differentiate those two, uh, you can use ultrasound. This was a paper that was looking at the efficacy of doing a T-shunt in uh, achieving detumescence. And you can see that um, in the first interval here at 12 hours, it's 100% uh, effective according to this study, but as the duration increases, the chance that the T-shunt will fully resolve this decreases. This is showing the same thing, but with two additional studies. And um, also they include the percent of these patients that go on to develop erectile dysfunction and that ranges from about 40 to 90. These are all of the different, uh, T shunt, uh, different distal shunts that are available. The T shunt is shown here. Uh, in, in addition, there's one called a winter shunt, which involves using a biopsy needle, inserting it along that same axis. And then there's an operative uh, open distal shunt, which is called an Algorab shunt. And um, it's part of the AUA guidelines that uh, there's not a lot of data comparing the efficacy of these different distal shunts against each other. So which one is done really depends on uh, what the surgeon is comfortable doing. This is what a proximal shunt looks like. And this is only done after the distal shunt because there's higher rates of complications and more difficult to do. Um, the advantage to doing this perennially as opposed to penoscrotally is that um, the spongy tissue around the urethra is thicker here. So uh, decreased chance of injuring the urethra. So going back to the patient who came to the hospital after having failed three rounds of phenylephrine, um, when he first came in, he got bilateral T shunts at the bedside. Um, that was only partially successful, so he then got the operative Algorab shunt, that's the open distal technique. From there, he got an operative proximal shunt, and when he was discharged home um, with anticoagulants, 
he was able to avoid, pain was better controlled, and he was scheduled to follow up in two weeks. One of the uh, stresses of this paper by Reed is the role that anticoagulation might have in improving the efficacy of this distal T shunt. And so their suggestion is to use aspirin and heparin uh, before any shunt, and then follow that up with aspirin and clopidogrel. Um, they didn't quantify this data at all. So um, there's not a lot of data to support um, how efficacious this might be in improving um, the response to this T shunt. I think this could be an area where they could do more research in the future. So one of the main goals here is to preserve erectile function. And we know that after a duration of about 36 hours, there's almost invariably going to be some degree of erectile dysfunction. So the question becomes, uh, when is the best time to do this penile prosthesis? Um, the advantage to doing it early is that it can resolve the acute episode and address that uh, inevitable erectile dysfunction. Also, there's less fibrosis, so it's easier to do. And the AUA guidelines are suggesting 72 hours as the cutoff for doing it, but there have been some newer papers looking at when exactly might be the best time. So this is one of those. And um, this was a review of 100 patients. Um, they divided them into two groups where the first one had the prosthesis done at about seven days, whereas the second one was closer to five months. And what they found was that the degree of penile shortening and need for revision was much lower in that early group. And they were also uh, significantly more satisfied with the device. So this is the algorithm that uh, they're suggesting. It starts out the same um, with phenylephrine and aspiration. Then it differentiates based on the duration where at less than 48 hours, they suggest trying the shunt, um, using the snake maneuver, which is essentially the same as tunneling. And then if that fails to do the prosthesis at about three months, uh, sorry, three weeks. Um, and then in the longest duration group after 72 hours, their suggestion is to do the early penile implant. Um, and then in those intermediate group, um, they're suggesting using imaging to differentiate whether or not there might still be perfusion. And if there is, to first try the shunt. So that's all I have. Um, I wanna thank all the residents who helped me put this together. Um, they had given me a lot of suggestions and uh, different ways to make it better. So really appreciative of that. Also, they've been teaching me in the operating room every day. So really thankful for that. Um, and thank you to the, all the attendings who have had me in the OR the past two weeks um, and will have me hopefully in the next two weeks. And also to Lucia for helping to get this set up. So thank you. Questions? Thank you. So can you speak a little more about the use of ultrasound after you dissipate it down and the different process of the down to go forward with another shot? It's hard to differentiate. Mm -hmm. I know that's in the guide, yeah. but it's a little confusing. Yeah, let me go back to, um, actually it doesn't really relate to this, but um, the description in one of the papers that I read is that after you've done the T shunt and tunneling and the erection is still persisting, um, you have to determine whether this is true recurrence because there's no flow or whether this might be a post ischemic hyperemia, which um, sort of just like a reaction to the trauma of all these shunts. So their suggestion was that by doing an ultrasound, um, if there's high flow, that would mean the shunt is still open and what you're seeing is the post ischemic hyperemia. Whereas if it's closed, um, it's closed prematurely. Um, and that would, that would show as no flow on the ultrasound. 
I don't know if that answers the question. So it's, if it's not high flow, then you're done because there's flow, right? If there's no flow, it's, so it's there is flow. if there is flow. Yeah, right. there's no further intervention needed if you've identified it as post ischemic hyperemia. So I saw Marisen um, wrote that up. They did a initial violation and the tunneling. Right. So would you waste your time doing ultrasound if you're saying you're done at that point? You need to see well. If you're not going to do a proximal shunt, you can say you're done, you do the tunneling. You know, you're not I, don't, I don't know. So fine. So you're, you're tunneling, then you're done irrelevant to whatever, whatever the outcome. Well, I would say the following. You are you're done in terms of operating. I think that your smooth muscle changes, so it becomes ischemic, and if you get low going again and the smooth muscle starts working, you want to continue with phenylephrine injections. So you want to kind of stimulate the smooth muscle to continue to relax. Okay, so I would not do any more operations, but I might continue with the phenylephrine injections along the way. Does that make help? Okay, Dr. Weiss's smooth muscle lab. That's what changes. If the smooth muscle doesn't respond in the ischemic state, once it comes back to a less ischemic state, then it will respond to the So you may actually get more flow with that at that point. Or I should say you get more outflow. More smooth, more smooth muscle contraction. So that's an algorithm. Do your tunneling. Now let's say, so that can go so went off, because if you see it's high flow now, then you're done. If you see it's low flow now, then you're starting to fill out. I will probably do, I, I, you know, we've talked about this, I think, you know, again, it's not part of the guidelines, but I think, if you think of the physiology of what's going on, I think you want to continue to do that up and injections to decrease. The, you want to get smooth muscle contraction, and as the muscle starts to regain its function, it was a scheme, but it's not dead. Then it'll start working better. You'll be able to get the work down, and that's going to be better for the smooth muscle long term. If I ever give you any setting, that would be better. That's what I'm talking about. Well, that's the different mechanisms what the saturated receptors and things like that. I think that's a different mechanism. 
Okay. All right. Our next presentation will be from Walter Shang, who uh, is originally from the Bay Area, graduated from Yale for undergrad, uh, went to, is also now in uh, medical school here at Yale. Um, in terms of his other interests, he was a consultant for Boston, uh, Simon Kutcher and Partners, where he helped price the most expensive RCC drug at that time. Uh, during that time, uh, during his free time, he enjoys skiing, and this fall, he'll be pursuing uh, an MBA at Yale School of Medicine. Good morning. Uh, thanks for having me back. Um, and thanks for the opportunity to talk today about um, how the Affordable Care Act has affected urology and what we might be able to expect in the future. Um, just to disclose, I do still do some uh, healthcare consulting. Um, Simon Kutcher has no um, financial interest in this presentation. So today I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the background of the ACA as well as insurance, move on to specifically how the ACA has affected access to urological care, um, and then talk about future implications for uh, where urology might be headed in the post-ACA era. So I think the American health care system likes to think that uh, it's very patient-centered. I just want to offer a potentially more uh, cynical view that uh, maybe it's more insurance-centered. You know, who we see uh, how things are priced, how we're reimbursed, it all depends on insurance. And uh, with insurance being so central uh, to our healthcare system, I, I think it's always important to consider um, how do disparities in insurance specifically affect uh, care, um, urological care in this instance. So the main goal of the ACA was to uh, reduce the number of un uninsured um, through a variety of mechanisms. Uh, the main one being Medicaid expansion. It also established the marketplace exchanges, healthcare subsidies. Insurers could not refuse pre-existing conditions. Um, there's also the individual mandate, which was actually um, repealed uh, as of 2019. And then you had dependent coverage. And uh, Medicaid expansion is a cornerstone of uh, the ACA. 37 states, including DC, have adopted um, clearly it's uh, several states in the South that have uh, not adopted the Medicaid expansion. At, at a superficial glance, uh, the ACA achieved its goal. It reduced the number of un uninsured, uh, as we see a drop uh, since the implementation of the ACA uh, in 2014. But uh, there are a lot of big studies out there that uh, tout all the successes of the ACA uh, saying that we increased coverage, therefore we increased access to care. Uh, I do want to emphasize you know, uh, coverage does not equal accessibility necessarily. Um, coverage in itself is not equitable. Um, and we can see that particularly with Medicaid patients. There's a lot of evidence out there that show that uh, uh, providers in general are aware of Medicaid patients, primarily due to lower reimbursement uh, as well as the other uh, factors listed on this slide. To give an example, um, Medicaid reimburses about 60 to 70 percent of what Medicare pays. As a urologist in Connecticut, uh, you will be paid about thousand dollars for a radical prostatectomy for a Medicaid patient, um, and you will be paid about seventeen hundred dollars for a Medicare patient um, getting a radical prostatectomy. So if these big studies are flawed, uh, how how can we measure access to care? Um, one of these methods is using secret shopper studies. And this methodology basically involves uh, researchers pretending to be patients. They call up physician offices asking for an appointment, um, asking if they take Medicaid. Um, so um, they call about a specific clinical scenario, inguinal hernia. Uh, we did a number of these studies looking at expansion versus non-expansion states, and we always called uh, each office twice with the cl same clinical scenario, uh, one being uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield, one being Medicaid. So when we called general surgery offices, we see that in expansion states, Medicaid patients have uh, reduced ability to make appointments compared to non-Medicaid patients in non-expansion states. Obviously, the disparity between private and Medicaid is, um, is uh, very apparent. When we call uh, specialty surgeons, namely orthopedic uh, 
um, we see that same effect, but it's, it's really much higher. Um, again, expansion states uh, have reduced access to make appointments for Medicaid patients. Uh, we didn't do these studies, but a number of uh, groups out there performed these secret shop shopper studies in urology. Uh, one group showed that Medicaid patients waited 12 days longer to see a urologist compared to Medicare patients. In Philadelphia, uh, they showed that um, when a patient's trying to seek initial uh, prostate cancer treatment consultation, um, they are two and a half times less likely to be able to see a urologist that accepts their insurance versus a radiation oncologist. And when they do see a urologist, you're waiting much longer, on average six days longer. Uh, and that has a lot of implications for how a patient might initially select uh, where to go, who to see for initial treatment consultation. So the problem with these secret shopper studies is that they're very time intensive. Uh, it takes um, a researcher to call up each individual office. So um, it, sample sizes are generally very low. Uh, we decided to do a meta-analysis examining 34 studies, all secret shopper studies ever published. Um, this encompassed uh, over 10,000 phone calls with a good mix of specialties uh, in different geographic locations, as well as different time periods. Uh, and not surprisingly, uh, each study has generally shown that uh, physicians, providers are much more likely to pay for private patients or Medicaid patients. Um, a little bit more interesting is that the disparity between private and Medicaid patients, specifically seeking specialty care, is greatest, where the relative advantage of a private patient uh, is three, about three times that of a Medicaid patient in seeking an appointment. And we look at after the ACA versus before the ACA, we see that this disparity has increased. Um, our uh, meta-analysis uh, had selected a, a good variety of specialties, um, showing that you know, urology is definitely up there uh, with the disparity between private and Medicaid patients. Not as, uh, it's not as bad as uh, dermatology, orthopedics, or pain medicine. Um, definitely it favors private insurance patients more so than other specialties. So the next question is, you know, if access to care is different, is care itself different? Um, Amadeen Jamal, uh, Shishong Hong are cancer researchers out of the American Cancer Society. Amy Davidoff is here out of our School of Public Health. Uh, they, they've shown that since uh, expansion after the Affordable Care Act, um, there's been an increase in early capture of uh, di early diagnosis for cancers, namely colorectal, lung, breast, and melanoma. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, you know, is that the case for urology? Uh, we presented this at AUA this past year. Uh, Dr. Leitman and I have been working on trying to answer the question, uh, did the ACA really result in changes in insurance status among testicular cancer patients? Secondarily, did it affect diagnosis and treatments in testicular cancer patients? Um, the hypothesis being that uh, um, testicular cancer patients are young. Um, the ACA primarily expanded insurance in the young population and uh, young men are historically the, uh, the people who are most underinsured in America. Uh, to do this, we did a difference in differences model. Um, and what that is, is it basically takes the period before implementation, the period after implementation, uh, adjusts for age, race, socioeconomic status, et cetera, um, to try to look at, tease out where exactly do these differences occur. Um, so we're not just looking at the crude rates. Um, but we found that the largest increases in Medicaid occurred in low-income patients in expansion states, showing that the uh, ACA really did uh, successfully target who was it intended to target. Uh, we didn't see uh, much change in early-stage diagnosis of testicular cancer. Treatment patterns for um, testicular cancer have been changing uh, before the ACA, so it's hard to de tease out those differences. Um, if, if the patterns are actually affected to the ACA or previous trends. So in the last few minutes, just talking about where uh, we might see uh, urological care headed post ACA. I wanna focus on, on one area, um, particularly um, increased utilization of urgent care, ED and inpatient care uh, for urology and present some evidence for that. Uh, so you've seen this slide already, um, basically to remind you that uh, Medicaid patients in expansion states have reduced access to appointments. But the question is, you know, if physician offices are rejecting these patients, and you know, these patients can't seek care there, 
where are they going to go? Where are they going to get their care? One hypothesis is that they're going to seek immediate care opportunities, such as that at urgent care. Um, this summer, we had uh, done this research, basically repeating all our secret shopper studies. Um, this one was calling urgent care centers, asking for an appointment um, at a, a, or a kidney stone. And what we, showed, uh, what we showed is that in expansion states, there's actually greater accessibility for Medicaid patients. So the flip side of what's happening in physician offices. Um, interestingly enough, uh, when these patients, even when Medicaid patients go to the, uh, the urgent care center, they're still more likely to be referred to uh, ED than private patients. Again, these urgent care centers are primarily uh, for-profit driven. And this gives some hints into you know, how our system is funneling patients uh, to EDs, to safety net hospitals, uh, such as that. <clears throat> this was a large population study that looked at the change in share of ED visits uh, before and after Medicaid. What this is showing is basically the share of Medicaid visits to the ED uh, uh, outweighed the decrease in uninsured visits to the ED. So since expansion, you've had more Medicaid visits uh, than the relative offset of uninsured patients. And this plays into the idea of a term called moral hazard, where um, when you're more likely to get insurance, you're more likely to utilize it. But that utilization is not necessarily high value, right? Or if they're all going to the ED versus you know, physician offices or other places of care, it's not necessarily high volume, high value. Uh, this was uh, abstract presented at AUA last year, um, looking at, uh, in Kentucky, uh, the changes in inpatient and ambulatory urological surgery. Basically, what this is showing is that since expansion, there's been a decrease, uh, there's been an increase, excuse me, for inpatient urological surgery compared to previous trends. Um, and there's been a decrease in ambulatory urological surgery compared to previous trends before expansion. And again, this is and supporting the hypothesis that uh, with these Medicaid patients, they're, they're more likely to be shunted to hospitals through these EDs, getting their surgery in the safety net hospitals. Again, not necessarily something that's high value care. I just want to spend the last minute, I'm not going to go into detail, but just want to pose two other areas uh, where we might see urological care headed. Uh, one being that specialty um, services are going to see reductions in reimbursements. Um, specifically, as of 2019, there's been a number of new payment models that have been implemented, um, and that's going to likely cut, uh, cut um, reimbursement rates, as well as uh, surgeons and specialists trying to be incorporated into the ACOs. Um, so again, that's likely to cut reimbursement rates. With, uh, of course, with, again, health policy, health legislation um, environment, uh, we're likely to see just greater insurance frustration. Um, specifically, uh, we have the repeal of the individual mandate as of this year, and that's going to inevitably raise healthcare costs. Uh, so to conclude, uh, the ACA has uh, in increased the number of insured, but maybe it's important to consider, maybe it's also increased the number of underinsured. Um, you know, I want to emphasize coverage is not equal to accessibility. Uh, certainly, the ability to see a urologist has likely decreased since the ACA. Uh, we still need a little bit more time to evaluate uh, if the ACA has really affected uh, urological uh, disease and treatment patterns. Um, and uh, also, most certainly, we're likely to see an increase in urological visits to the ED and inpatient services, uh, specifically at safety net centers like Yale, that they're going to be, deal with, be dealing with a lot of Medicaid patients. I want to just leave with this impression that I had is, um, Everyone's getting a new used car with ACA, and now people are wondering uh, why the traffic's so bad. Uh, thanks to Dr. Leitman, Dr. Kenny for their mentorship and advising on putting together this presentation. Uh, Dr. Foreman, Dr. Schuster, and Dr. Wisnia for their um, guidance in all these access studies. Thanks uh, to the uh, Department of Urology for a great sub-intern experience, as well as a number of undergraduates over the years that have really helped put together a lot of these access studies. Thank you.
Yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure. I, I I didn't look up what the reimbursement rates for what were for radiation oncology. We've built several models over the year that saying that um, of course uh, reimbursements is related to um, acceptance rates. In our models, we've shown that's maybe about 15. That explains about 15 percent of uh, the model. Um, and that's probably the greatest effect that we're going to see. So yes, I, I would imagine it's primarily driven by the difference in reimbursement rates. I don't know what that exact uh, difference is. You may have said something that was a little bit straight talk. You said about moral hazard is increased utilization. Yes. Is it only in the ED or is there increased utilization in the primary care setting as well? I imagine there's also increased utilization in primary care setting. And that's why in expansion states, we're seeing this inability to access appointments. There's been a lot of studies out there specifically showing that there's an increased wait times just to see these patients because they're so overburdened. Our studies had also shown that um, just some of, of appendix like we see an increase in wait times in expansion states. So it's likely that physician offices, primary care physicians are likely to be overburdened. With the ACA, we didn't change the infrastructure so for primary care. Aspect, it was lacking access to primary care was quite confusing. Potentially, yeah, it could be that, yeah, definitely. But in general, if you think about it, as an uninsured patient who newly gains Medicaid, they're not familiar with the healthcare system. You know, if something does happen, there's more more likely just going to bump into the ED more so than, than probably in a primary care office. So uh, I think overall, um, and we're not, not just looking at urological studies, but in general, there have been numerous research groups out there that have shown uh, better outcomes in cardiovascular health. Um, there's been just a huge focus, I think, with the ACA primarily on uh, a, a primary care. They did try to increase reimbursements for primary care physicians. So I think a lot of studies have out there shown um, improvements in health outcomes in the internal medicine primary care arena. Um, I think, you know, for, you know, in these specialty services, urology included, it, it's going to be still some time before we see how, um, how ACA has affected. Where specialists are kind of lagging behind in terms of all the new reimbursement models, models payment models, um, all these new uh, ways of health management that are not covered by the ACOs. And because of that, I think we're seeing some of those lags in outcomes uh, in specialty. Thanks. So we have another 20 minutes. Um, it's about five minutes. Uh, so our last presentation is by Brian Caps. Brian is from uh, Mountain Grove, Missouri. He did his undergraduate degree at the Naval Academy in Annapolis. Uh, he's currently a medical student here at Yale. Um, his research interests um, have to do with mostly the treatment of prostate cancer. Um, and the future, he hopes to be a urologist in the U.S. Navy, and he enjoys running and training for marathons. Brian. Hello, thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the introduction, Juan. Um, I think I've met most of you, um, but I'm currently a sub-I um, on service, so um, thank you so much for kind of letting me come and talk to you today. Um, just going to... 
Okay. Um, my presentation's on curative therapy for prostate cancer, um, prostatectomy versus radiation. Um, we're going to look at some of the recent outcome studies and uh, look at therapy utilization at the end. I have no conflicts or interest, uh, no disclosures to say. Um, and just a quick overview of my talk. A um, very quick background on prostate cancer, some of the management choices we have for it, um, some of the guidelines that um, suggest what we should do, as well as the current treatment evidence and a little bit of my research on treatment utilization um, and some quick conclusions we can make. Um, we all know prostate cancer is the most common non-cutaneous cancer in men, has a high incidence every year, a high number of people die. Um, and appropriately, the treatment algorithms are actively debated. Um, a lot of the focus has been on active surveillance um, with increases in utilization of this over the past decade. Um, but the curative treatment choices of radiation and radical prostatectomy are also um, debated as well. Um, about a year and a half ago, this New York Times article um, came out, um, popular prostate cancer therapy is short, intense, and unproven. And in this article, it basically talked about patients choosing new therapies um, with a lack of substantial evidence behind them. Um, it discusses the anxiety patients have with providers and the kind of, um, kind of stumped attitudes providers have in suggesting therapies that don't necessarily have great data behind them. Uh, management for localized prostate cancer is kind of directed by us um, from the National Cancer Comprehensive Network guidelines. Um, they kind of break it down into risk category and expected survival. For very low risk prostate cancers, we actually do have preferred modalities, mainly surveillance, um, secondary to something like external beam radiation therapy or radical prostatectomy um, in patients who have high survival. This is similar in our low-risk prostate cancers. But as we go up to our more intermediate-risk prostate cancers that are favorable, we start to see a breakdown in what exactly should be done with the patients who have long-term survival. Here I point out that active surveillance, external beam radiation therapy, and radical prostatectomy with lymph node dissection are all equivalent options for a patient to consider with providers. Um, and this is actually seen in the unfavorable and immediate risk patients, as well as the high risk and very high risk patients. Um, and so that leaves us with our curative therapy options, either radical prostatectomy or external beam radiation therapy with a mix of brachytherapy afterwards or commonly deprivation therapy as well. That leads us to the question, who should get prostatectomy and who should get radiation in the treatment of localized prostate cancer. Well, when we think about answering this question, how do we do this? Uh, randomized control trials are kind of the best thing that we can have to address this. And the now um, famous PROTECT trial had 10 years of data experience with radical prostatectomy, uh, external beam radiation therapy, and surveillance. And what this study found was that there was a prostate cancer-specific survival that was actually the same between all the therapies. Um, if you actually looked at disease progression, there was a little bit of a difference. Um, the curative therapies ultimately led to a um, higher risk or a lower risk of disease progression. But there were some problems with this trial, and it was predominantly in patients that were of lower risk prostate cancers. Um, when we're thinking about other questions, patients who have high risk, when we're thinking about the latest treatment advances in radiation or surgery, we have to think about other ways of answering this question. And to do this, we basically are left with observational studies and retrospe retrospective cohort studies um, that use kind of statistical models to account for confounders and matching patients, something that the randomized trial would have done in a lower risk population. And so um, what is the treatment choice evidence? Well, a meta-analysis was done a few years ago in the European Journal of Virology that looked at 19 different studies of moderate risk bias. Um, they actually found that there was an overall um, mortality and prostate cancer specific mortality um, was higher in radiotherapy patients to prostate cancer or prostatectomy um, with a hazard ratio of 1.63 for overall mortality and a hazard ratio of 2.08 for prostate specific cancer. Since then, as I kind of alluded to earlier though, there's been advances in radiation therapy. This ASCENT trial from 2017 
um, looked at patients who had external beam radiation therapy and patients who had external beam radiation therapy with brachytherapy boost. And what this trial actually found that there was a PSA recurrence free survival in the patients who had the boost therapy compared to the patients who only had external beam radiation therapy. And the newest studies that have been observational and retrospective in nature have compared these new treatment modalities in radiation with radical prostatectomy, specifically Kishin et al. and Berg et al. in 2019. Um, Kishin et al., um, this article was in JAMA, specifically looked at patients who had higher Gleason scores, Gleason scores of 9 and 10. And what Kishin et al., um, Kishin et al. was a retrospective cohort study in 12 tertiary centers, um, had around 639 radical prostatectomy cases, 734 um, external beam radiation therapy cases, and 436 external beam radiation therapy with brachytherapy. Um, primary outcome here was prostate cancer mortality. And Kishin et al. found that the patients who had received external beam radiation therapy with brachytherapy actually had a lower risk of prostate cancer mortality compared to both radical prostatectomy as well as um, external beam radiation therapy alone. You can see here, this is their primary outcome, prostate cancer-specific survival, and there's a difference between the survival cohorts. Um, they also looked at secondary outcomes of metastasis-free survival and overall survival. Um, they also found significant um, reductions in risk for distant metastasis-free survival um, and less of a difference for overall survival. Um, Berg et al., um, the most recent study looking at this in the European Journal of Urology, looked at a different patient population and actually found a little bit different results. Um, Berg et al. was a retrospective observational study in the National Cancer Database. Um, and they specifically looked at young men less than age 65 with limited comorbidities, um, specifically high-risk prostate cancer. And they compared 12,000 around cases of radical prostatectomy with around 1,700 cases of external beam radiation therapy with brachytherapy. Their primary outcome was different because of a limitation in the National Cancer Database. It's just overall survival. And what they found was actually a different result than um, Kishin et al. They found that external beam radiation therapy was actually associated with a higher risk of overall all-cause mortality, a bit slight, hazard ratio 1.22. Um, you can see the survival curves are very similar here. Um, so just kind of bringing it back to what I've been doing in my research, I've been looking at national trends in utilization of these different therapies, um, specifically patients who receive radical prostatectomy only in the National Cancer Database, radiation therapy only, and radical prostatectomy with postoperative radiation. Um, as has been seen in other studies, there's been a massive increase in radical prostatectomy um, over the last decade. Um, for my 12-year study, um, it went from just below 50% to around 70% in 2016. And this was kind of followed by equivalent decrease in radiation. And so here, this, this solid black bar is the number of patients who've been receiving radical prostatectomies. And this lighter gray bar is the patients who've been treated with radiation therapy as primary treatment. This middle gray bar is kind of what is unique about my research. It's the patients who've been receiving post-operative radiation therapy after radical prostatectomy. And what I have found is this is also increasing um, over the last 12 years, um, significantly in all patients, um, but with the greatest magnitude of increase in the high-risk treatment categories. Um, specifically, those um, compared for the increases in preoperative for the increases in postoperative radiation therapy um, in the high-risk patients, as I said, it had the highest magnitude of change over the last 12 years in comparison to the intermediate-risk patients um, and the low-risk patients. And so just quick inclusions moving forward. Um, certain groups may have um, benefits to one of the therapy or the other, um, but there's definitely no definitive answer on the question of radiation therapy or surgery as our primary treatment for prostate cancer, or even surveillance when we consider the low-risk patients. Um, regardless, as I've kind of shown, significant changes in therapy utilization are taking place. Um, a lot of the papers discuss the need for a randomized controlled trial um, comparing the latest radiation therapies with radical prostatectomy. Um, 
I don't know if that's the right focus, um, considering kind of the discussion with like the New York Times article about like patient preference and thinking about kind of the side effects. There are other ways to go with this. Um, so that's kind of the next step probably. Um, these are my references and um, thank you so much for letting me become uh, a sub eye on this service. I've been really enjoying my time um, with the attendings, with the residents, um, with the support staff. Thank you so much, Mr. Matteo, for helping me set this up. I know got some last minute emails um, and thanks Dr. Shulman for letting me come today. Um, any questions? <laughs> Um, as far as, thank you for your question, is specifically for the treatment outcomes, like, um, I'm not for sure on the data right now for that. Um, I know that for radical prostatectomy, they often have more immediate um, uh, issues with um, erectile dysfunction, um, as well as um, post-operative things. Radiation therapy, the effects are more long-term. Um, I didn't look at those studies, though. Thanks for your question, Dr. Foster. Um, I looked um, in a lot of these papers, like they're like final kind of conclusions that we need one, but they don't like cite like a trial that's like um, in process and I, I couldn't find one either. Yeah, so I know um, for something like the PROTECT trial, they obviously like published a correlating study with that, specifically talking about these side effects. Um, the problem with external beam radiation therapy and brachiotherapy is these are like newer observational studies suggesting this. 
um, and a lot of the databases we use to like examine this um, don't go into specifics on a lot of the complications. So the National Cancer Database is a great resource, but does not go into a lot of the specifics on um, what is actually going on with the patient symptomatically. Um, I'm not for sure if the patient at all article that was uh, done in a tertiary center, if they collected side effects, I didn't see that in their paper, um, but that would definitely be something as a next step for um, research in this topic, if it really is a more significant morbidity or decrease in quality of life. Dr. Lee. Any other questions? 